Hey students, it's Coach Hirsch. Today I'm going to talk to you about fiscal policy. You should be on section 9 of your BOK. It's kind of just a general question about fiscal policy. We really want you to just jot some notes down about what fiscal policy is, what it's comprised of, and some of the drawbacks. Uh, if you have any questions after this lecture, please feel free to ask me or Ms. Rosenfeld. We'll be happy to help you. So to start off with fiscal policy, let's look at an analogy, and specifically the car analogy. The economy is like a car. You could drive 120 miles an hour, but it's not sustainable. Uh, if we're going to make uh, the analogy here to the economy, it's going to say it's extremely low unemployment. So think about the acceptable range of unemployment being 4 to 6%. This would probably be somewhere around 2%. It's great in the sense that a lot of people are working, but it's just not sustainable, and we're setting ourselves up for a fall, which means a lot of layoffs. Driving 20 miles an hour is too slow. The car can easily go faster. So this would be high uh, unemployment, so think well above 6%. And we know that the car is capable of going faster. We don't want to be reckless, but we know we can go we can uh, go faster than 20 miles an hour. So we would meet in the middle. 70 miles an hour is sustainable. That would be full employment. Again, somewhere in that 4 to 6% range. And that would keep us on a nice steady pace as we grow the economy. Some cars have the capacity to drive faster than others, industrialized nations like the United States versus third world nations. If the engine technology or the gas mileage and the productivity increase, then the car can drive at even higher speeds. So let's think about the production possibilities curve. When we started talking about that in the beginning of the semester, we said that any time there was a point of production along the curve, um, it was because we only had um, a certain amount of resources. We couldn't push that curve outward unless we were able to get new resources, new technology, or something along those lines. So in this particular case, if we increase technology and increase productivity, we can expand that curve, we can push that curve outward, or in this case, grow the economy. So the government often will speed up or slow down the economy by using fiscal and or monetary policy. And why is that? Well, again, they don't want the, they don't want the economy to grow too fast, but they also don't want it to go grow too slow. And so the, the government working with the Federal Reserve can, can affect changes that can uh, help achieve those goals. So what is the role of the consumer in the economy? Well, we pretty much have the most important role because it's all about spending money. We've got to buy things. And if we're not buying things, then the economy is not going to grow. So what happens if incomes fall and people stop buying things? Then who steps in? Well, most of the time it's going to be the government and or the Federal Reserve. So the government stabilizes the economy through two ways. They have two different toolboxes they can use. The first one, the fiscal policy, which is what I mentioned before, actions by the Congress to stabilize the economy or monetary policy, which is actions by the Federal Reserve Bank to stabilize the economy. Today, we're just focusing on fiscal policy. So discretionary versus non-discretionary fiscal policy. Discretionary fiscal policy, uh, an example of that would be Congress creates a new bill that's designed to change demand through government spending or taxation. So they can either increase spending uh, or decrease spending, or they can increase taxes or decrease taxes. The problem with this approach is that it time lags due to bureaucracy. If you follow the news at all now, you know how difficult it is for Republicans and Democrats to come together to agree on anything. So if you wanted to implement something like this, it takes time. In a recession, Congress would want to increase spending, for example. So think back to the recession of 08, and President Obama working with Congress introduced a spending bill, almost a trillion dollar spending bill. and. Um, a lot of people say that that's one of the major reasons why the United States was able to pull itself out of the recession. Then you have non-discretionary fiscal policy. These are things that are already there, that they don't have to fight over necessarily. Automatic stabilizers is what we call them sometimes. Permanent spending or taxation laws enacted to work counter-cyclically to stabilize the economy, which is just a fancy way of saying, hey, we've put these things in here, so if the economy goes south, this will help keep the economy somewhat afloat. So think of welfare, unemployment, minimum wage, etc. If you were to lose your job, you could get unemployment benefits. And this can help keep you spending. You're not going to be making as much money as you used to make, but it gives you some money and allows you to continue to grocery shop or maybe buy some clothes for your kids or whatever you might need. And again, that keeps the economy moving. Maybe not fast, but still moving. So we look at contractionary fiscal policy, and we also look at expansionary fiscal policy, the first one is contractionary fiscal policy, which would be the brake. So think about the car. This is when we want to slow the economy down a little bit. These are laws that reduce inflation and they decrease GDP. 
remember we talked about GDP last year, gross domestic product. You want to decrease government spending and increase taxes, which is which if you increase taxes, you decrease how much money we have in our paychecks. Or you can do both. And then you have expansionary fiscal policy, which is the gas. Hey, we want to get the economy moving. So this is laws that reduce unemployment and increase GDP. So we want to increase government spending, or we want to decrease taxes, or we want to do both. Supply-side economics is kind of what we're experiencing now, and that is, um, it's a theory that basically says that economic growth can be created by lowering taxes and decreasing regulation. Um, according to supply-side economics, uh, consumers will benefit from a greater supply of goods and services, which will be now lower uh, priced and employment uh, will increase. So two examples of this in, in, in uh, recent history are President Reagan, which was this was referred to as Reaganomics, and Donald Trump. Donald Trump basically recently working with Congress, cut taxes, corporate taxes and income taxes, and has also been um, a big champion of deregulation. Now, when President Reagan instituted this, it did, it did help pull the economy out of a, um, a recession, but it also added to our national debt. And it remains to be seen what will happen with Trump's policy. Okay, problems with fiscal policy. Basically, there's three of them. One is deficit spending. So a budget deficit happens when the government is basically spending more than it's bringing in. So if you think about, uh, you know, you spending money, and maybe you have a, a job, and you have all these bills, but you don't make enough money to pay those bills, that's a problem. So the budget deficit happens... And as a result, the national debt is accumulation of all those budget deficits over the time. So if you keep, if you're unable to hit your budget over and over and over, or Congress's case, or the government's case, year over year over year, then the debt keeps accumulating, and you have to pay interest on that debt. So most economists agree that, bow, uh, that budget deficits are a necessary evil because forcing a, a balanced budget would not allow Congress to stimulate the economy. What does that mean? Basically, it means that if we were in a recession or something along those lines. If we needed to spend money to pull ourselves out of recession, that it's kind of unreasonable to think that we always have to have a balanced budget. That should say three problems. I don't know why it says five problems. But anyway, number two, problems of timing. Recognition lag. Congress must react to economic indicators before it's too late. So sometimes they have to look at things and try to be proactive. Uh, if you're too late and you want to introduce a spending bill or a taxation bill, um, it, the damage can already be done, and then you could end up in a really prolonged recession, or, or perhaps worse, a depression. Uh, you have administrative lag. Like I said before, Congress takes time to pass legislation. And you have operational lag. The spending and planning takes time and organizing uh, an organization and execution. So you just because you pass the bill and you put the money out there doesn't mean that it's going to get to the right places quickly. And then the last one is politically motivated policies. Politicians may use economically inappropriate policies to get reelected. So, for example, a senator promises more welfare and public works programs when there is already an inflationary gap. So, today we looked at fiscal policy. We gave you just a brief overview of what it means um, and, how, and how Congress uses it um, to help speed up or slow down the economy. We're thinking of uh, increasing spending and uh, decreasing taxes if we want to grow the economy or decreasing spending and increasing taxes if we want to uh, slow down the economy. If you have any questions, like I said, please ask me or Ms. Rosenfeld. We'll be happy to help you. Talk to you later.